this guy needs no introduction. Um, he was my mentor and he's the, the inspiration behind this uh, wonderful jazz studies program we have here. And he's going to uh, talk and he's also uh, play a little bit with the band that's going to be performing tomorrow night at the jazz festival. So, so I have a lot of hands for the great Ellis Marcellus. Just get introduced. Yes. <laughs> Usually, whenever I do the uh, this type of activity, uh, I ask the students if they have any questions. Rather than just uh, lecture, I'm sure we get enough lecture. Oh, well. I got a, I got a question. Yeah. I mean, in I mean, you know, in your broad perspective of things, what do you, do you feel like young musicians nowadays? Um, is it is it more difficult, or is it about the same in terms of like? Uh, developing a sustainable career in playing jazz or I mean what is your observation? I mean what, what's necessary for young musicians now? I guess that's a pretty hard question I guess. No, I don't think I think it's a realistic question. But uh, uh, I remember during the time of when I was playing with Al Hirschman, he had a manager in New York and we used to go in and out of New York a lot. And uh, I would always go and try to find Edward Blackwell because he left around 1960. And I would ask him about different guys that we knew that had left here and gone up to New York. And finally, one day he said, man, look, he said, everybody who was in New Orleans and they were doing great, they're doing great up here. The ones who wasn't doing nothing in New Orleans, they ain't doing nothing up here. And basically, the, the, the essence of what his reference was is that if you decide to pursue uh, music as a career, don't necessarily uh, consider like a one-way street of, of, of thinking in terms of being a jazz musician. It's best to think in terms of becoming a musician who has jazz skills. And I think sometimes that's a difference in some uh, young people's attitudes. Uh, because, uh, you know, when I was growing up, all of us who were aspiring to play jazz, we all had that New York syndrome, you know, nothing new. Actually, the only one of us who went <laughs> was Edward Blackwell. And he didn't go because of the music. He had a personal thing that caused him to have to leave town. But at any rate, um, one of the things that I have noticed that uh, has changed, now I'm, I'm looking at this more from the outside. It appears that those of you who may not necessarily be opposed to teaching, if you get a master's degree in jazz studies, you have a much better chance of uh, university jobs than if you don't. And also, you have a good chance of continually developing your skills in a program if it's a good jazz studies program, not all of them are good, 
But uh, I think it's a plus today. You know, when I was in school, even trying to get a bachelor's, it was easy to get kicked out of school for playing day. Now, you know, people are going to school and uh, getting master's degrees in their studies, which I would have to say uh, is a certain amount of progress. But uh, for the most part, I, I still think that the primary situation is to actually become a, a, a top flight musician who has jazz skills. Now that is just in relationship to uh, going to school with the anticipation of working in some capacity after getting uh, a degree. But it's like I remember my late colleague Harold Baptiste. He had a framed sign in his office. And he had written in pencil about three asterisks. And it says, but can he play? And I think ostensibly that's the whole point. So if uh, going to the university is something that you can see as a plus, you have to remember in the final analysis, it's about can you pull it? Incidentally, for those who don't know, that's Harold Batista. This is more for like piano players and uh, pianists. Uh, a lot of like older uh, mentors that I have, I always ask them who did they prefer, Art Tatum or Oscar Peterson, because Art Tatum is like this mastermind who plays it all and. Oscar is like, you know, he plays it all, but he's got this more bebop sensation to him. Did everybody hear that? Uh, this is kind of a little refresh. The whole, well, the idea of saying, well, who do you prefer, Oscar Peterson or Art Tango? Uh, Art Tatum was, was a, phenom a phenomenon in the first magnitude. There's a video at which Oscar Peterson is on, and Oscar was saying how he would get nervous whenever Tatum came to one of his gigs. And uh, Tatum was listening to him, so finally, Taylor said to Oscar, he said, look, you can like me, hate me, or whatever it is, but when it's time to play, just don't be concerned about that. You got to play. You know, so forget about like nerves or whatever it is that's preventing you from being who you are. There's an interesting book which is not about music at all. Uh, the title of it is called Say Yes to the Mess. And it was written by a businessman who wrote this book for business managers. 
And then you talked about improvisation. And uh, he mentioned the difference between Oscar Peterson and Sonny Rollins in the book. And he was saying, uh, well, he was uh, like an amateur piano player. And that was Barrett. Uh, I think it was John Barrett. I forgot his name. But anyway, he was really a, an enthusiast about Octavian. I mean, about um, uh, Oscar Peterson. He said, but what he eventually noticed about Oscar Peterson was kind of a, a linear approach to what he did. And as a, as a result, what you heard in Oscar was great plan of the same thing. Whereas he talked about Sonny Rollins, who was constantly trying to play something that he either had played and didn't want to play again, but he was constantly reaching for something. And uh, the analogy in this guy's book had to do with informing people who are uh, managers and businesses, you know, to be a little more like Sonny Rollins in terms of trying uh, to make sure you don't get stuck in one particular situation. There's, there's a lot to that, especially if, if, if uh, you're talking to some of the businessmen. Because the, the competitive aspect in the corporate world is not quite the same. Because in reality, Oscar did not compete against Sonny Rollins. But uh, it, it was good to read that. Are all of you in here music major? Jazz studies majors? <laughs> Any business majors? <laughs> you know, the first year I came to the University of New Orleans to teach, we had, they had the remnants of a big band. Uh, Charles Blanc had been dealing with the big band. And the lead trumpet player in the band uh, was a business major. And he, I mean, he really, he could really play that lead. So, so I was asking because uh, not always do you find everybody in a situ playing situation that is if they're in a university that they're not that they're majoring in one uh, particular subject. And uh, some of you may decide at another point in time to pick up some. I've encountered students uh, that was kind of amazing to me at first um, until I realized that the generations of things are changing. Uh, there was a kid who was from Seattle. I did a workshop in Seattle. And I, I'm standing here, and all, everybody was there. This kid was behind me on Fender Rose piano. And uh, so I really didn't see him. It was a while before I even knew he was there. And finally, I got the, you know, the five minute sign toward the end of the workshop. And when I looked around, I saw this kid, I said, man, I didn't get to hear you play at all. You know, I said, I need to hear you at least play, you know, before we leave. He said, well, what do you want me to play? So whenever somebody asked me this, a question like that, I said, I want you to play Monk. So 
And there were other jazz students, some were like seniors. He was a sophomore in high school at the time. And it was a rhythm section. So he decided to play straight no chaser. And he played in octaves, two hands, and left the bass player and the drummer behind. And I said, okay, I don't have no advice for you. <laughs> Fast forward a few years, I saw the same kid at the Juilliard School when a friend of mine was, was teaching jazz at his dad. I just read, the only reason why I really recognized him is because he had red hair. But uh, it was my understanding that he finished uh, from the Julia, went to Columbia, got a Jewish doctorate in practice in law somewhere. It was a similar situation with a student here, yeah. who came from the University of North Carolina and had majored in math, but was excellent piano player. In fact, he was good enough to be a piano player in Donald Harrison's band. And he eventually made his own CD. Well, he too is practicing law in Washington, you know. So, uh, and there are a few other examples of people that I've encountered uh, over the years. One guy I didn't meet for many years was a pianist named Denny Zeitler. Now, Denny Zeitler, it's somebody whose recordings I had heard and used to hear the tales about him. Because see, when he was in med school, he was playing the clubs up in San Francisco. And there were times when he would have to leave the gig because of some patient stuff. He uh, eventually he became a psychiatrist. And the son of a good friend of my wife's decided to do a similar thing in practicing medicine, although he wasn't a musician. He majored in psych psychiatry and went to practice in uh, San Francisco. So I told him, I said, look, <coughs> I said, there's a guy out there who's been in, uh, in the San Francisco area as a psychiatrist for a lot of years. I said, I never met him, but I, you know, I've heard about it. I said, so if you, uh, you know, find out anything about it, let me know, because maybe I'd like to try to contact him. And he said, that's interesting that you would say that because Denny Zeitlin ended up to be his mentor. <laughs> you know, talk about like small work. So I went out to Frisco one time on the gig and called my friend's son, and he set up a, a lunch. And for the first time, I actually had, was able to meet Zeitlin. You know, I don't know what he was, 35, 40 years down the road. You know, and uh, there's a, a lot of experiences that you can get if you are really good at what you do, especially uh, if you decide that you're going to be a musician who has jazz skill. And I, use, I like to put the, an emphasis on that because I think all too often 
there are young people who will go to jazz programs and think in terms of being a jazz musician. And uh, without thinking in a broader sense of being a musician who has jazz skill. So I'm not sure how many of you fit into which category. Any questions? <laughs> Have you noticed any uh, any differences in the, how the music business is run? No. no. Business is business. <laughs> um, you know, just... Uh, I had a chance over the years to meet different people, some that come on the records. Uh, but all of business basically is business. The music business as we have known it as when I'm doing the time that I was growing up uh, is a not very good shape. Uh, well, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't put it like that, but it's different now. For one thing, if you uh, have computer skills and uh, you can go online and either Amazon or iTunes or whichever. And if there's an album or CD or a list of songs by an artist that you like, you can buy it for 99 cents. Well, when I was growing up, we didn't have that. You know, it was either buy the whole thing which wasn't about prices at that time. You know, you could get a, a vinyl recording for $2.99. But um, the business has changed in that sense. Now, there's also YouTube. You can go on YouTube. I was just, uh, my son, Jason was at the house yesterday, and I asked him, I said, have you ever heard uh, Jimmy Lunch's band? He said, no, I don't think I did. Well, I just went online, got on YouTube, and 20th Century Fox had a short clip of Jimmy Lunch's band. And it was a good representation. You, some of you ought to do that if you have never heard Jimmy Lunson's band. See, the bands in the early part of the 20th century, Cab Calloway's band, Duke Ellington's band, uh, which was before Convention's band, uh, the concept was one of showmanship. You know, like two of the saxophone players came out of the section and was tap dancing. I mean, seriously, to do that. And one of the trumpet solos was playing a lot of high notes. And it was a tenor player. Uh, I don't know who it was. They, they didn't list who was in the band. It was a very good tenor player. But the whole of the emphasis was on the show. Everybody was in like tuxedo or some other being the form of dress. But um, it's interesting. Any of you ever go back and research that? Research what exactly? Huh? Research what exactly? Well, like Jimmy Lunch's band. Or earlier performances of the Elton band, or Cab Calloway's band. They had a lot of great musicians in it. The only 
person in Cab Calloway's band that wasn't a musician was Cab Calloway. <laughs> I mean, Cab had music sensibility about him, but he was a good businessman, and he understood how to put together a band with the arrangements uh, with the arrangement of Jimmy Mundy, who used to write Johnson, and uh, everything about what he did was um, in the business. There was a guy in the band who would lay out the tuxedo for all the guys in the band. So all you had to do was bring your instrument, and the tuxedo was that. And uh, there's a book called The Bass Line by Milt Henson. Very good book. It talks about his turn with Cap Calloway. And also, uh, Milt was sort of like an amateur photographer. And he had pictures of a lot of these people you can see in his book. But from a historical perspective, I think it's a very good book. And it's not really limited, it shouldn't be limited to just people who are involved in music, because it's not nearly about music. It was about the times that he lived, how he got from uh, Chicago into New York. You know, it's a, it's a good all in all autobiography. Oscar, did you ever see any of those bands come through New Orleans when you when you were growing up? Like Munsilford or, or Calloway, did they stop through here? Or? No. No. Um, I heard from people who did see Jimmy Munster. But, uh, I was a little too young to get in the space at that time. Uh, I saw Duke's band in later years, because he came uh, to Al Hurst Club. And Woody Herman's band came to Al Hurst Club. But this was like 70-ish. You know, well, no, actually the late 60s. But uh, things had changed to a point where those early bands, they were really dance bands. And uh, I just did a kind of a, a workshop with some high school kid in Huntington, West Virginia. And somebody asked about how does one learn how to swing? And uh, I was telling them about the, the, the concept of swing originated with the dance, with people, with guys and male and female dancing with, with each other. Freddie Green, who was guitarist with uh, basic dance, told me that when they would play, he would look on the dance floor and pick out whoever was the best dancer on the floor and just zero in on that person. And that would be the primary source of his groove for the basic band. You know, and uh, so the whole concept of swing is emanated from the dance. Now, there were a lot of tap dancers during that time. Uh, Bill Bojangles Robinson was one of the tap dancers who had a good, had a pretty big reputation. Now, Honey Cole was also a tap dancer. He was not too impressed with Bo Daniels. Because he said, man, Bo Daniels would be dancing on his toes. He said, we was dropping heels. And a lot of what the drummers eventually picked up, which 
you know, the count of bebop came from that, from playing behind the, the, the dancers who were dropping heels, and that, you know, not just the sound, but the rhythm involved in what they were doing set the, the pace uh, for what the bench drummers would eventually do. Because before that, all of the drummers, they just played four on the floor. Max did too, but you didn't hear it. You see, so, the group of high school kids that I was talking to in, in Huntington, uh, I asked them, after I told them about, you know, the roots of the swing being a part of dances and guys and girls dancing, you know, I asked them, I said, do guys in your school, do they dance with these girls? Do you all dance together? And a couple of girls said, no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, on a slightly different tangent, I think that the concept of dance has become uh, like a spectator sport. Uh, the guys and girls were still dancing with each other, you know, when I was in school. Uh, started uh, in elementary school. See, they used to have a, uh, what do you call them? Things? They played 78 records and had about advanced technology. And the teachers in the elementary school, uh, the female teachers in the elementary school, would get the recordings and uh, we'd have to promote dances at the school after class. And like guys like me would be holding up the wall, you know, the teachers would come over and say, come on, get off of that wall. <laughs> See that young man? Go get her up, dance with her. <laughs> I didn't have no feeling for dance, nothing. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I mean, it took me a while to figure it out, but eventually I did figure it out well enough to not continually embarrass myself <laughs> trying to dance. Uh, but at that time, I had no concept at all, not only about jazz or music or any of that, it's just what socially what people did. And, uh, but one of, one of the things that I noticed uh, today people go to concerts and they look at uh, Beyonce and her dance crew or uh, any number of people, even in commercials, you know. There are there people who dance in groups as a part of whatever is being presented, whether it's a commercial or a show. And it, and it didn't really just start like that. I remember uh, uh, during the time I was in the military, it was back in the 50s, television was sort of just about 10 years in, just getting, hitting a stride. And there were groups uh, like Jackie Gleason had a show and he had dancers on the show. And uh, another guy who was with the Sinatra bunch, uh, he had a show. And there were dancers on the show. They were all female dancers. Uh, most, most of the time, if there were any male dancers, it would usually be in a Broadway show. So if you went to see uh, a musical, musicals were popular 
up until the time that the break-even amount for a musical was at forty million dollars. Now, that was forty million dollars then. So there not that there were no not that many musicals being made after that. But for the most part, that is the, the whole idea of uh, the dancing, which has become a spectator sport, has its roots all the way back at that time, when, t when the television set became more and more popular in people's homes. Because the more people stayed home, the less they went to dancing. <clears throat> You know, I can remember my wife's mother talking about a place that they went in New Orleans, uh, and where they were going to go dancing. But I think we have pushed it to the side now. In it, yes. Um. Yeah, I was wondering, um, over the years, through like um, your experiences in education, or just um, you know having musicians want to sit in with you on the bandstand or playing with people that you might not have heard before, are there any qualities in a musician that um, you hear that make you think, you know, oh, this person can really play beyond just like, oh, he can play Cherokee at this tempo, or you can groove in this style. Like, is there an essence to hearing people that make you think, you know, like, that this person can really play or succeed? I'm not if I heard it all. Any, any musicians? Any people that... I'm asking, is there any certain quality or qualities that you hear in a musician, like if you're hearing them for the first time, um, that stand out to you, you know, and thinking that they can play and succeed in music. That they can play what? Well, I guess, you know, play anything and, and uh, have a successful career playing music. Is there a certain quality that you hear in somebody that makes you think, you know, okay, this person can do it, they can hang or whatever. Well, my problem with answering the question, see, I don't hang out. I don't got too old. <laughs> <laughs> so whatever is going on, you know, I've missed it. And uh, I don't know even uh, musical types of TV shows. I don't know about that. If I'm looking at the TV, it's either the news or football. <laughs> you know, that's pretty. That's pretty much it. Um, so I'm not altogether sure about what the situation would be, because uh, I used to have conversations with my youngest son, Jason, which uh, well, he's gone now, so every now and then we might snap something. And uh, he has very strong opinions about things to say the least. <laughs> and uh, we had uh, uh, one of our few conversations last night. And like you were saying, they just uh, don't have leaders like we used to have. You know, leaders of groups and the examples of leaders, which uh, if you look at big bands, you can look at Duke and Count, 
you know, stacked them, they had a big band, put it on them. Uh, and then there was some smaller, not big, big names that had bands, because there was work for people who played in bands. And uh, the difference between then and now, uh, every now and then, I will catch a uh, streaming on my computer from a uh, business club in New York. And I get a chance to hear some of the musicians that's playing there, which I would assume is, you know, typical, typical of what's going on in New York with the musicians. And uh, <clears throat> most of it, what I have heard, I think, uh, the late Joe Temple, who was a baritone saxophone player in the uh, Lincoln Center day, he had a very good article in this magazine that is printed at a university. I can't remember the name of it. And he was asked about you know, being in New York and going out and listening to music. And Joe said, well, man, I'm not really interested in somebody's project. And there are a lot of groups who have, I guess, what they call projects. But the older I got when I was able to sort of look back uh, in retrospect, uh, I re one of the things that I realized, in fact, that you, we were talking about that night, uh, we lost a sense of community. Now, a lot of that could be said about the country as a whole, because I don't really think that any area Concentration, like if you, you young people, you are thinking in terms of studying jazz music. Whatever it is that you happen to be doing is affected by the whole of everything else in the country, especially if you're dealing with some art culture which really emanated from here. So um, when the Musicians Union was against guys playing jam sessions in clubs, the, the Musicians Union said, well, man, that's free music. You don't get paid for that. Well, they didn't really understand what the jam session was really about. And it's true that it was free music, but at the same time, the prospect of learning a lot of what you were trying to do, especially in, in, uh, in terms of jazz or uh, bebop or whatever you want to call it, being able to play with other musicians in a club situation, uh, which is about it, you couldn't do it in school, meant that that was the foremost place for you to learn what you were trying to do. And I do think at some point there was a lack of uh, a loss of community. This program, which is uh, as close as I can think of for the university program, as being like a community. And in various, because I haven't really been to a lot of institutions, but some of the few, uh, I remember. Uh, I met a 
a CD with my oldest son, Brent. It was called Love Ones. And uh, we went to different institutions uh, performing. And I remember quite often students in the jazz program at some point, somebody in the program would say, well, after I get my jazz degree, and uh, one day, Francis told me, he said, man, he said, do you have any idea how many tenor saxophone players are standing in line? at four o'clock in the morning, trying to get to play at the Vanguard. Do you know what that's like? Because the school aspect, as great as it can be, has created a, a deception in certain people's minds about what it is that they're doing. And unless you have people, I mean, you know, look at the faculty here. Yeah. Victor. Steve. I mean, these people are players. You know, Steve and I played a gate, a duo gate for two years at a club called Tyler. But if you're in a situation where you have people who play, then that's something that you need to take advantage of. Because I remember my late mentor, Harold Baptiste, he and I were talking about learning jazz in school. And Harold, even though he was teaching there, he was not a, a, a big believer in people coming into school learning to play jazz. And he said he voiced as much. And I said, well, Harold, I think you're right. I said, but what is that? Where is it? What's left? I mean, what, what he and I did to learn how to play is like what uh, Carl Gable told uh, the female need and gone with the wind. That's when he said, like, what you see here, Charlotte, today is gone with the wind. <laughs> And like what we did is gone with the wind. And there's no, you know, there's no way to bring anything back. Uh, not that I think it would even be a good idea. You know, some of the pluses. When uh, musicians were beginning to move into smaller groups, like on 52nd Street in New York, you know, like every night and on Fridays when I'm at Snow Island, when I leave, Frenchman Street is reminiscent of 52nd Street in New York. With the amount of people that's on the street, the musicians, clubs across the street playing, and all of that. Um, as much of a plus as that was, just from a learning standpoint, the country was in the throes of a war, which is called World War II. And the government introduced a war tax. And the war 
tax was 10%. Now, those people in uh, clubs that had to pay the 10% were the ones who had bands, who had shows. You know, if you had a band, like when Duke Ellington was at the Cotton Club, they would dance, there was a chorus line, there was a comedian, there was a tap dancers, there was a whole show. So they had to play, had to pay 10%, which wasn't a problem for Only Madden, because Only Madden was a gangster anyway. And they made a lot of money until they went to jail. <laughs> but um, on 52nd Street, what you get are small groups, no show. You know, Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie. Errol Garner was going from club to club playing solo piano during the intermission. And musicians that were playing small clubs, they didn't have to pay the 10%, but there was no show. And I can only imagine how much actual learning of music took place on 52nd Street then. Because we didn't have anything in New Orleans like 52nd Street. But there were places that we could go and learn. And <clears throat> also here, like we could go to each other's house and practice. You know, for, for a little while, I uh, was a tenor player. I was in high school. And um, I had started taking piano lessons, but I wasn't all that serious about piano. And the tenor saxophone became the instrument of this time. But like earlier, the clarinet and the jazz band <coughs> was prominent. Jazz band, you know, like the Hot Five, Hot Seven, and different what they call the Dixon Man band. You have trumpets, trombone, and clarinet. Well, as things begin to change, and when I say that, what I mean is uh, a lot of things. First of all, people, the technology started to advance. People started to get to the 78 records, which was only about uh, two and a half, three minutes max. And then we call them on both sides. So you could get a recording. The first record that I had by Oscar Peterson was uh, 78. And I had a lot of 78 records. And uh, listening to this one. And the term saxophone became a prominent instrument in small groups. And uh, so I went to my folks, I said, man, you know what? I said, I need to get a term. So my dad bought me a tenor. Now, my father didn't know nothing about music. He couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I got a tenor saxophone. And I started to play in what at that time was called rhythm and blues band. Whatever the popular song of the day was. And uh, eventually, when I met well, Harold was about two or three years ahead of me at Duke University. Uh, when I met Harold and started getting more and more serious about music, and uh, 
I've practiced some, done some solos, and what have you. And uh, there's a club called the Jew Drive In. And on Sundays, there were jam sessions. You know, sometimes, and uh, if some prominent bands would come in, then the club owner would not object to it. I don't know if uh, basic band came in, and Sad Jones came and started like a jam session. You know, Sunny Payne and, uh, you know, different people would, would sit there. Anyway, I would go on Sunday sometimes, sometimes I'd play piano, sometimes I'd bring my channel. Now, the difference at that time, it was prominent for the jam session to feature simple songs. There's a lot of blues that being played, and the heads, you know, it was not, you know, that difficult to learn. And, because uh, it was all primarily, you know, simple heads, and then guys would start trying to show whatever they could do with the solo. So one Sunday in particular, I was sitting on the piano, and this tenor player started playing, and uh, I started listening to him. And uh, I wasn't even sure what he was doing. But after that, after I heard him playing tenor, I went home, put my tenor in the case, I never took it out. <laughs> <laughs> who, who was it? Huh? Who was it? Matt Paralyzed. Oh. Unfortunately, the only documentation of Matt Paralyzed is on the recording on the monkey puzzle. And that's, that's the only one that, he, he did a lot of recording with uh, Alan Toussaint on the records that, uh, that was a lot of rhythm and blues records that was made here. But uh, for the most part, by the time I graduated from Diddler, I realized that uh, since I was off of my daddy's nickel, I had to figure out what I was going to do. <laughs> and the piano was the only thing left for me. And uh, so I had to start really seriously trying to practice, which is what I did. Fortunately, my second piano teacher, who was no longer living in New Orleans, had actually shown me how to practice. Because uh, I didn't really know how to practice until I started with her. You know, things like hand posture, hand position, attacks, releases, all things like that. I didn't know about that. I had all kinds of bad habits. But the point is, uh, I got pushed into the pain that caused me to get serious. And uh, it was either that or go get a real job. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Ellis, I want to, uh, before Jason comes pick you up, I want to see if you, would you like to play something with the band? Because uh, I want to remind everybody that uh, Ellis is going to be kicking off the sandbar tomorrow night. So. Hope to see everybody there, and uh, he's going to be right. playing with Victor on Victor uh, Atkins' ensemble. Thought it'd be nice if uh, Ellis had an opportunity to play with the band. <coughs> that was a question. Now you could say yes or no. <laughs> <laughs>
nose and feet flat as the tail.
uh, I think we should uh, check out Ellis tomorrow night at the, at the Sandbar. And, uh, is there anything else uh, that's coming up for you uh, that you'd like to tell people about? Or, any new recordings? Uh, I know you've been in the studio with uh, Steve Gordon and... Uh, yeah, uh, uh, probably not going to be out until January. Okay. Like, I don't even have a name for it. All right. Yeah. What, are you, what are you recording? Is it original music, music or, the, or, or standards or what? No, it, we had, we recorded a mixture of stuff. Uh, I have, uh, recently, started to think about uh, the quintets. And I started. I'm, I'm working on a, on like a treatise of quintets because the the approach that some of the, the college jazz studies programs take is usually you get uh, big bands one, big bands two, or however many students you got for that. And at another point. With miscellaneous instruments, you get uh, combos, and I think that overlooking the quintet, you know, for example, uh, in my own personal opinion, uh, the writer, the composer, who was the best at quintets, was Horace. See, Horace Silver. Not only uh, demonstrated in his music three very basic principles: blues, swing, and the uh, structure of his of his music. He would put what we used to call them interludes. So instead of just having uh, some guys playing ahead and people soloing and then playing ahead and taking it out. And there's some good recordings using that formula. Uh, but for the most part, Horace had all kinds of little parts in his music that was like interludes. And, uh, I was thinking that it would be good to in, interject that whole concept of uh, quintets into the curriculum, so that there was, you know, so it becomes a concentration on the quintet, you know, not just a combo, mm -hmm. and not that anything is wrong with a combo. I think that uh, we're going to uh, see you guys at the sandbar tomorrow night. And uh, how about a hand for the great host? Thanks so much, man. That was great. Wow, man. You're doing a lot of stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah. That was really interesting.